This is another lecture in sensory system. And we will do a legend book recap of the previous lecture. We have done the uniform distribution of electrical potential. Why is it there? It is there and it is characteristic of which part of the neuron soma. We have done facilitation of neuron, spatial summation, temporal summation, very important, and decremental electrotonic conduction. This lecture, by the end of this lecture, you will be able to describe fatigue, synaptic delay, divergence, its types, di with diagrams and examples, convergence with its types and diagram and examples. You will be able to define reciprocal, reciprocal inhibition with its concept and its diagram and example. You will be able to describe what is after discharge and what is reverberatory circuits. These are extremely important properties of synapses, very important properties of synapses. And these are the last part of synapses that we are studying. This is your reading material. So what is fatigue? From the word fatigue, what is fatigue? You are familiar with fatigue, what it is? You get fatigue, what do you think? What happens at the synapse level? So yes, there is decrease or depletion in the neurotransmitter quantity. The channels that are opened, what happens to these channels? They cannot stay open forever. And whenever there is still a neurotransmitter will come again and again, tries to open the channel, it will open. However, for redistribution of the ions that already caused the excitation, it takes some time because there was influx of sodium. So not much more sodium to go in. So it takes time for redistribution of the ions. That's another cause of fatigue. A third cause of fatigue is inactivation of the postsynaptic receptors that takes place with time. So these are the causes of fatigue. And what is fatigue? Fatigue it means that initially, when there was stimulation at the synapse level or the presynaptic terminal was uh, excited and it caused release of neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter caused excitatory postsynaptic potential, action potential with time. Even when there is a neurotransmitter, even when there is stimulation of the postsynaptic potential, with time, gradually the response decreases and there is no action potential anymore. Why it is important? What do you think? What do, why it is important? Imagine that uh, a neurons, synapses, they keep on being excited. It's especially important in the case of seizures because seizures, what stops seizures sometimes when treatment is not given, it is that particular synapse. Of course, it doesn't mean that we have to wait till fatigue happens because a lot of damage could have happened by that time. But fatigue is one of the reasons that helps in stopping seizures. It helps in also, you know, the synapse takes time to re-energize itself. Again, rebuild up of the neurotransmitters. Again, activation of the receptors. So it gives time to the synapses. It's considered, as we mentioned, it's important for controlling seizures. Muscle cramps, you get muscle cramps. If there is no fatigue, you keep on working and working and there is damage to the muscle because lactic acid is accumulating. Mental tension, you need fatigue to be relieved from this, from the mental tension. Because imagine if your neurons are not fatigued, you know, sometimes what happens is there's a lot of tension and then suddenly you are just, your mind, you feel it's fatigued. And that is good. It relaxes the mind and body. So it's considered, considered as a short term, a term as adjustment of pathway sen sensitivity, okay? Is there any long-term mechanism for changing synaptic sensitivity? how synaptic sensitivity can be changed in the long term by yes by by uh, decreasing the formation of receptors that's one way number two by formation of inhibitory receptors these also they cause 
they help in the adjustment or it helps in the changing the synaptic sensitivity. So one thing is down regulation of the receptors. It helps and also formation of inhibitory type of receptors. A patient with acidosis or hypoxia might go into coma, whereas a patient with alkalosis might go into seizures. Why is it so? Because patient with acidosis or hypoxia will have inhibition of synapse, synaptic activity. Acidosis and hypoxia, both they cause inhib inhibition of the synaptic activity leading to coma, whereas alkalosis is excitatory to the synaptic uh, junctions to the synaptic transmission. So alkalosis causes so much firing and seizures. Caffeine, it's a drug that, is, that makes you alert because what does it do? It stimulates the synapses by lowering the threshold. Another drug for insecure, theophylline also decreases the threshold and therefore causes excitation. Strychnine, is also excitatory drug. How does it do? By inhibiting an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Because if an inhibitory neurotransmitter is inhibited, strychnine causes excitation of the synapse. And the inhibitory neurotransmitter that it inhibits is glycine. Inhibitory drugs are anesthetics. What they do is they increase the threshold. By increasing the threshold, they cause inhibition. Synaptic delay is another property of synapse. Synaptic delay, about 0.5 millisecond, there is 0.5 millisecond delay in the transmission. And why is it so? We mentioned this in the differences between electric and chemical synapses, if you remember, because action potential has caused to reach to the presynaptic terminal, it has to open the calcium gold gated channels. Uh, the secretory vesicles, they have to move to the presynaptic membrane. They have to release the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter has to travel through the synaptic cleft and has to act in the postsynaptic receptor. And then actions has to take place. So it takes time, about 0.5 milliseconds. Let's have a look at how CNS is formed. CNS has neuronal poles, what we call it, in which there are input fibers and outward fibers. There is a threshold stimulus and there is sub-threshold stimulus. Threshold or supra-threshold stimuli are the stimuli which will cause action potential. Sub-threshold are the stimuli which have caused excitation, but they were able to make the excitation reach or the, the potential, the excitatory post-synaptic potential to reach to the threshold and therefore they were unable to cause action potential. Now have a look at these neurons, one, two, and here, A, B, C, D. Which ones are input and which ones are output? One and two are input neurons, A, B, C, D are output neurons. Now, if you have a look at this diagram, the input two is threshold stimulus for D, but it is sub-threshold stimulus for C because only few fibers are going to C. One neuron one is threshold stimulus for A and it is sub-threshold stimulus for B. So it is a discharge, this area zone is called as a discharge zone. Whereas this B here, this is called as facilitated zone. Why? Because there was no action potential. It was facilitated, it was excited, but not it has not reached the threshold. Whereas here, this is discharge zone. Why? Because it caused excitation to the threshold limit and action potential was found. So discharge zone is mostly at the center where the maximum branches are. At the periphery, only few branches are going. So this is the facilitated zone. Facilitated zone like facilitation. The area was excited, neuron was excited, but has not reached the threshold and there is no firing, there is no action potential. This short zone is also called as excited zone, liminal zone, facilitated is called also as sub-threshold zone and subliminal zone.
Now, if the input neuron is inhibitory, where inhibition will be maximum? Center or periphery? Again, central. It will be in the center. Minimum at the periphery. The upcoming synapse properties are extremely, extremely important. There is, from the word divergence, what does it mean? Divergence means, have a look at the diagram. When a single input neuron excites greater number of output neuron. In both cases, you can see that a single neuron is exciting greater number of output. Here, even more and here, still more than input neurons. This is the definition. There are two types. One is the amplifying type and one is divergence into different tracks. So the, the divergence of amplifying type in which the input neuron stimulates or excites increasing with ING, increasing number of output neurons. It keeps on increasing. Divergence of or a divergence into multiple tracks in which input neuron excites greater number of output neuron into different directions. Example of this one is the corticospinal tract starts from one neuron at the upper center and then excites at the end. The terminal is multiple fibers going to multiple nerve fibers, uh, multiple muscles. Here, the example is, in case of divergence into multiple tracks, you have the ascending tract, for example, when it goes up to the brain, some fibers, they end in uh, particular formation, some they go to the cerebellum, some in the midbrain, and some reach to the somatosensory area. So this is divergence into multiple tracks. The second, the very important property is convergence. Now we talk about convergence, convergence from the name when, a, when multiple input neurons, they excite a single output neuron. Multiple input neurons excite single output neuron. There are two types, convergence from a single source and convergence from multiple source. Now, these input neurons are from the same neuron. They are branches with the same neuron. They are exciting single neuron and single output neuron. And a very common example we have stu studied multiple times. You know, these firings are adjacent to one another. So what, what is here? A very important example of convergence from single source is summation, spatial summation. There is convergence from multiple sources, multiple neurons, and a very important example is the interneurons in the spinal cord. The interneurons connect and receive, it receives the signals from multiple input neurons, from the ascending tracts, from the proprio-spinal fibers, meaning fibers from other levels of the spinal, spinal cord from the descending tracts, pyramidal tracts, from multiple sources. So an example is the interneurons of the spinal cord. Reciprocal inhibition, another very important property of synapses. From the name reciprocal inhibition, reciprocal means two things opposite to one another happening at the time, at the same time. So reciprocal inhibition, it means that Incoming signals and incoming signals causing output excitation in one direction and inhibition in another direction. What is the cause? If you see this diagram, you will know what is the cause. So this is in both. It is actually coming here, causing excitation in one direction and inhibition in one direction. And the cause is having intermediate inhibitory neuron. An example is studied in anatomy. If you think, you remember in anatomy some examples? Whenever the agonist muscles are excited, the antagonist muscles, they are inhibited at the same time. After discharge, another property of synapse is after discharge, which is a prolonged output discharge. There are multiple causes of after discharge. One main mechanism is 
of the synaptic after the charge is that the channels usually stay open for a little time after the stimulus has gone. And of course, one thing we're all familiar with is the large neurobacteria because their action is prolonged. And another important cause of after discharge is the reverberatory oscillatory oscillatory circuit. Reverberatory circuits are extremely, extremely important. So these are three causes of after discharge. Channels stay open for some time, long acting neurotransmitters and reverberatory circuits. Let's see what is a reverberatory circuit. From reverberatory, from the, uh, the word reverberatory, oscillatory, there is re-excitation. So what happens is that the, uh, the, invo the, the input, it's a positive feedback, of course. There is the output keeps on re-exciting the same circuit. The output keeps on exciting the same circuit. See the diagram? Here. This is the simplest one. So this is an input exciting the output, but you can see the output is giving the branch to again re-excite the circuit, reverberatory circuit. Is it a positive feedback or a negative feedback? Yes, it's a positive feedback. So reverberatory circuit is a positive feedback in which the output keeps on re-exciting the same circuit. It can be as simple as this, or it can be complicated. And remember, sometimes in between these, they can be inhibitory. So this is excitatory. These are excitatory. Here, some of them are excitatory, some are inhibitory. Why do we need to have its inhibitory at the same time to stabilize the circuits? Okay. When does it stop or decrease? It stops because of a property we studied before, which is fatigue. And another reason is having some inhibitory intermediate neurons also. What are the mechanisms for stabilizing neuronal circuit? We studied one of them is fatigue. Second one is inhibitory. Inhibitory. Circuit. So short term is fatigue, and the second one is inhibitory circuit. Is being part of reverberatory circuit which, which was studied or inhibitory neuronal pulse basal ganglion. Another mechanism for stabilizing the neuronal circuit is up and down regulation of post synaptic receptor. Some neuronal circuits they have continuous signals emitted from reverberatory circuit. For example, sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system keeps on re-exciting again and again. So mechanisms for continuous signal output, one of the mechanisms is that the excitatory state is always above the threshold. So there is intrinsic excit excitability of that synapse. The firing, the excitatory state is always above the threshold. The second cause is for continuous signal output is the repository circuit. If you have any questions, we'll discuss in the lecture, inshallah.